Hey out there, rock and rollers. Welcome to show number 112 of the Ugly American Werewolf in London Rock Podcast. Brought to you by me, your host, Mac B, the Wolf, here in Europe. And I will be joined, as always, by my partner in crime and co-host, Gary Action Jackson, from the East Coast of the United States of America. And we really want to thank all you folks who tuned in for show number 111, on Journey's Frontiers, their 1983 multi-platinum success that featured so many different hit singles off of it. And it was great to do that show just because not only is it a great album that a lot of people loved and remembered from back in the day, but a lot of people did not realize, did not know the story that both Only the Young and Ask the Lonely were pulled off of it. It was ready to go to print. It was ready to go out into the public. They said, no, we're not going to use those two songs on this record. The A&R guy pulled them off to use them on soundtracks, namely Two of a Kind in 1984 and Vision Quest in 1985. And I have a listener here. His name is Gary Richards. And he sent me a note and said, hey, Mac B, I listened to episode 111 last night. Very impressed. I was a big Journey fan during high school. Both Escape and Frontiers were released during my high school years, but didn't know that certain songs were available, but held off for soundtracks. And we thank you for your note there, Gary, and appreciate you listening and tuning in. And yeah, that freaks a lot of people out. Like, you had these two big, huge hit songs that are obviously pretty good. The A&R guy recognized that they were pretty good, but it's like, well, if you're just going to stick them on the second side... I'll use them for something else. Uh, but we got a lot of great feedback on there. We got a like from Neil Sean Music, uh, which is always positive. So thank you for that, Neil. So uh, if you missed that one, definitely encourage you to go back and listen to episode 111 on Journey's Frontiers. This week, we're dealing with some serious business and some sad news. Of course, on January 10th, we lost one of the greatest musicians of all time and really one of the world's most innovative and compelling guitar players. And that's Jeff Beck. Jeff was a two-time member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, both from being in the Yardbirds and as a solo artist. And I can tell you as a teenager, when I first started to get into rock and roll, you know, new Led Zeppelin, new Eric Clapton really well. People told me, you know, there was this band, the Yardbirds, and they had Eric Clapton and Jeff Beck and Jimmy Page. And that was kind of my first introduction to Jeff Beck is through the Yardbirds. In fact, at one point when I was in the Columbia Record Club, I got a tape, a cassette called White Boy Blues, guitars of Clapton, Beck, and Page, just because I didn't know Jeff Beck's music that well. And I wanted an opportunity to get to know it better. And once I was in college, Beckology, the three CD box that came out, that was real career retrospective, really from like 63 or 64 to, to 1989, it really turned me on to him. I just thought, wow, you know, this guy's amazing. But he's also very different. He's not just blues based. Yes, the Yardbirds were a very blues based kind of band, but that's not all he did. He could do very heavy metal kind of stuff. He could do jazz stuff. He could do it loud. He could do it soft. And he collaborated with a lot of amazing musicians over the years. So we thought we'd take this opportunity to kind of do a retrospective, a tribute to Jeff Beck, talk through some of his career highlights and how we got to find him. And, you know, I was fortunate enough to see him a few times. We're going to talk a little bit about that as well. First, we're going to do a little bit of business. As our regular listeners know, we are proud members of the Pantheon Podcast family. You can go to pantheonpodcast.com or at Pantheon Pods on social media to get to know them. It's a network of maybe a hundred shows. There's really something out there for everybody. It's not just rock and roll, but we are proud members of it. And we have contributed to other members' shows over the years, as some have been on our show, like Jay Scott at The Hook Rocks, like Martin Popoff of History in Five Songs, Christy Alexander Hallberg of Rock is Lit, Paul Stevenson of This Day Rocks and Vintage Rock Pod, the CEO, Christian Swain of Rock and Roll Archaeology, and, of course, the Kiss Kings, Tom and Zeus of the Shout It Out Loudcast. We hope all those guys are doing great, and we hope we can have them all on later this year. We also have to thank our incredible sponsor, RareVinyl.com. And RareVinyl.com has over a quarter of a million products in their inventory, guys. And if you use the code PODCAST, P-O-D-C-A-S-T, you can get 10% off 
everything you buy, not just your first order, but everything. And they ship around the world. And I know a lot of collectors since the passing of Jeff Beck have been rushing out to buy Jeff Beck records. And if you want something in pristine shape, you want something collectible, something hard to find to commemorate Jeff and really hold on to his memory, go to rarevinyl.com or eil.com, use the code podcast, save your 10% and get your Jeff Beck treasure today before they're all gone because I noticed that a few of them had already disappeared before between the first announcement of his death and the next day from their catalog. So go to rarevinyl.com and see if you can find a Jeff Beck item that matches your needs. But back to our theme here today, obviously he's a legend, maybe not as well known as he should be. And in the United States, I think that has a lot to do with the fact that he is not a singer. And if you're not a singer, it kind of hurts you in the music world, but also because he was never part of a steady band that had a singer. I mean, Jimmy Page is huge, but he was in Led Zeppelin and he was next to Robert Plant all those years. And then he's worked with Paul Rogers and other great singers since then. Yes, Jeff Beck worked with Rod Stewart. And yes, he was in the Yardbirds, but I just feel like most people don't know who he is, especially in the mid 70s. Since then, he's been doing a great deal of a instrumental music, you know, not a lot with singers. Fantastic music, no doubt, but that usually doesn't rocket you up the charts or get you to household name status. Maybe he's just said, hey, you know me from my past, but you don't mean to me now. That's fine. I'm doing whatever I want to do. And that was kind of his thing. He was always going to do what he wanted to do, maybe to the detriment of his own career, but he didn't care about fame. He didn't care about just selling trillions and billions of records. He wanted to make killer music with amazing musicians. So he would do it with some people for a while. And then he would move on to something else. And if the winds of change weren't blowing in his favor, he'd just sit down. He'd go to his country state and play with his hot rods, you know, fiddle with his guitar in his spare time. But he was a true legend and innovator, someone I don't think we'll ever see the likes of again. So that's why on this show, number 112 on the Ugly American Girl from London, we're doing our special tribute to Jeff Beck right here on The Wolf. I'll tell you something, though, Uh, Mm -hmm. because I, like I think a lot of people, after the loss of Jeff Beck, I immediately ran out, went online, and bought some Jeff Beck records. And you know how they have those five classic albums kind of like in a little mini box set kind of Mm -hmm. thing? Yeah. They do it for so many people, and it's, it's kind of an amazing deal. You get like five records. I've got them as cheap as like 13 bucks before. And I think this was like 18 or 19 euros or something like that. And it had like blow by blow and wired. And, you know, it, it, it had like some of his classic records. Obviously, I think it's called five classic records. And I was tracking it yesterday because it was supposed to come. And it just, it, it was like sent out at 227, sent back to the seller at 228. Like, like it was immediately mm. broken or something like that, you know, or I don't know. Did somebody open and say, Hey, Jeff Beck, yeah, maybe I'll just take that. And we'll say we lost it. Or <laughs> you know, what have you. <laughs> so yeah, that's on Amazon. I, I must've bought the last one. Cause when I went back or others bought it and used their entire inventory. Right. So I didn't have the Jeff Beck albums that I wanted to listen to. I just didn't have them in physical form. Obviously we can listen to them anywhere we went, but I decided to listen to bottom Bullock because It's a blues album, and that's a good way to uh, spend your time when you're trying to mourn uh, the loss of some great musician. But also, there's a great... I mean, they toured with Jeff Beck on the Stars Along tour with Paul Rogers and Mm -hmm. Ann Wilson from Heart. You can tell I'm I'm in bad, rough shape this afternoon. Uh But Peter told a great story about how one day... Jeff's guitar tech like asked him to come out and play Jeff's stuff through Jeff's rig and all that kind of thing, like to to get, to get it warmed up or whatever. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, and he did it real loud, and he's like, "Okay, I can remember some of Beck's Bolero, I guess. Yeah, I, I can give that a shot or whatever." So he's on stage doing it, but the curtain's still up, right? Because it's it's before the show, and so he's like, mm-hmm. "I had a feeling people were out in the audience going." Oh, Jeff's really lost his touch after all these years. <laughs> He's really lost it, which of course he never did, but I just thought that was a funny story, and I might just have to include that here on our show if I can clip it in. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the great things was that the uh, when I started off on the tour in Utah, the first night of the, the first show, the amps that I had ordered didn't arrive from England. So 
I had a couple of marshals fighting. Now, marshals are, are kind of the ultimate tone and everything, but to get a marshal to work really nicely, it's got to be cranked really loud. And on a stage with, with Paul, who wasn't wearing monitor, he wanted to hear the monitors, he wanted to hear the stage. Okay. Two marshals cranked up, too loud on stage, you know, for, for a mix. So I had to turn them down a bit, which at the cost of some tone. Gotcha. Uh, anyway, Jeff Beck's guitar tech saw me struggle with the sound and all that kind of thing. So you, he, Scully. Scully, yeah. Gotta give him a name check. Oh, yeah. Such, Scully's good. such a lovely guy. And what, and what happened was Jeff had joined the tour from uh, a European tour, and on that European tour, so it was a, a drum tech called Yard Gav- Gavrilovich, and he couldn't come and do the American side. Now, Yard Gavrilovich had helped us with the John Bonham Memorial statue a year or two before or something. So we knew Yard, and we'd had been to parties together, the whole, <clears throat> as he was part of our little team. So whenever we got to America, Scully came up with Jeff's guitar tech, who actually used to be Russia's guitar tech. He was he looked after Getty and Alex. Oh wow! So his, story, his stories were great, and of course they're all bands that I loved and stuff. So he came, he came up and he says, "Hey, hey you Pete uh, Yard told me I got to look after you." <laughs> so I've just been touring Europe with Yard. He said, "Look out for me, Pete." I'm like, oh shit! Is it? What's your problem? Well, well, you know, my amps. Uh, I, I used the uh, amps called Victory or Comfort over in the UK and Europe and stuff. Okay. It's your handmade by a chap Paul Comfort and uh, uh, Vickers make these these things. And they, so I didn't have this, I had to use Marshall. So he said, well, what uh, what Getty and uh, Alex use out in America is this rock crusher thing. So crank <laughs> your um, amps up through this and uh, I'll, see, I'll see if we can get one for the next show, which was heading down West Coast. And he got on the, the phone to them and they didn't have any at the factory. So they, they sent the, the team in that night and made me one overnight and hand delivered it to the show. Wow. So I had this thing. So I had two marshals and two orange amps going through this sort of full blast. And then so it sucks all the power out. So you're getting the amps driven, but then the volume, they, they then control the volume that goes to the speakers. So that's what so you could really get great tone like you're blasting the dish. So we got on the other side of that was a few nights later, Jeff didn't do a sound check in the afternoon. So Scully comes up and says, Oh Pete, you couldn't do me a favor. I, I, I've had to repair I've had to get Jeff's favorite amp repaired and it's not back, but he's not sound checking today. Could you check it for me? So I went, yeah, sure. So I'm in this amphitheater all up in there with Jeff Beck's, he puts Jeff Beck's guitar on me, you know, cranks me through Jeff's rig and says, oh. okay, Pete, go at concert volume. So <laughs> this is about, I don't know, four o'clock in the afternoon. And I was thinking, I haven't played any Jeff Beck songs since as a kid, you know. I, I used to have a go with, you know, Beck's Bolero, you know, every, sure. every guitar song. And another solo that I loved was the solo that Jeff did on uh, People Get Ready with Rod Stewart, you know. Huge so one. I thought, and I used to know that. So. But when you haven't played it for 25 years or 30 years, and you're in an amphitheater at full volume, you sort of fumble on the net, you sort of try and find the bit, a bit so you're not straight there. So, <laughs> <laughs> I was doing that at full volume. I just realized there's about 10,000 people outside <laughs> queuing to see Jeff Beck. <laughs> and they're hearing Jeff Beck guitar solos played really badly. It was the quickest return of tickets. Can we have and our I, money back? I please? just got the and I started <laughs> thinking, you know, 10,000 people out there going, oh shit, Jeff's let himself go a bit. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll not. <laughs> oh man, that's good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great story thanks for sharing that yeah that is pretty funny though okay i can i can imagine yeah, the people sitting in the office in the audience like what is going on here like oh that has to be like something else is going on it can't be that can't be jeff Beck. probably so yeah no but uh the loss his loss was just it was very sudden and it was very sad kind of hit me like a ton of bricks yeah and i i feel the same way i mean i was just be bopping along through my day and the thing comes up on the news feed and it says, I see it out of the corner of my eye, it says Jeff Beck. Okay. Well, I, he'd been on right. tour with Johnny Depp. Maybe he's working on something else. Maybe he's done. Okay. You know, doing a special show died. What? No, come on. And it was, yeah, very sudden. He was, I guess it, it, he got meningitis, which is apparently I was reading up on that. That's horrendous. So or hopefully no one that we know comes anywhere near that. It was very quick. I mean, I guess that's the only saving grace is that he went very quickly. But, yes, yeah, scary. And uh, even though he was, what, 78? Yeah. I still think, like, he, with what he was doing now, like, gone too soon. I mean, he still had stuff that he was he was trying to get out there. 
I know, yeah, and I'm like you. I didn't really know much about meningitis, so I go on CNN. What is meningitis that killed Jeff Beck? I'm like, yeah, ooh, damn, you know, that's that's pretty nasty stuff. Mm. Yeah, I guess it's good that he didn't suffer, but it, it's also too bad. It's because you know no one had the chance to say goodbye. You know, and that's that's, right. that's, that's the one part of uh, the, the only good thing about having some kind of like prolonged sickness or you know dying slowly is that everybody gets a chance to kind of make peace with it to say goodbye. You know, it's not like Neil Peart who, you know, he got brain cancer, but he didn't tell anybody. So all those around him, everyone who knew him and loved him, you know, had a chance to, to right. spend time with him and check in on him. And, you know, eventually he lost his battle. It's almost like Jeff got it on a Monday and by Wednesday night he was gone or something like that. It's, mm -hmm. it's crazy. What's your first memories of, uh, of Jeff Beck or, or, or learning about him or coming to his music? I think that I, I knew him kind of like in the, in the ether, like you knew he was up there, you knew he was in the yard birds mm -hmm. and that he had played with Rod Stewart in the seventies. I'm sorry, in the sixties. But I think the biggest thing for me was that record he put out. I think it was 89 called the guitar Jeff shop, Beck's Jeff guitar Beck's guitar shop. shop. Yeah. yeah. And, and so then it was kind of like, okay, I listened to that and thought, well, yeah, this guy's the real deal. Why have I not heard more from him? Why have I not heard these tracks off of, you know, truth and, and, you know, blow by blow and all of that. So I think that was the, that was my gateway was that right. Gotcha. Yeah. And that's, I remember reading about it in Rolling Stone magazine when we were in high school. And the thing is in the eighties, Jeff kind of took, I won't say he took the eighties off cause he was always working on stuff. He was always doing things and he did some tours, but I don't think he liked how music had gone in the eighties. I, I don't think he, really like the the kind of new wave thing and the pop stuff you know i don't think that was his element so instead of just forging forward and making odd records that maybe tried to fit into the genre he just kind of did his own thing he's got a lot of hot rods uh, you know he lives in the country and plus he has and had tinnitus mm -hmm. he had it really badly and so that kind of prevented him from from touring and i remember in i want to say it was it was either i think it was 89 89 or 90, he did a tour with Stevie Ray Vaughan. And Stevie okay, Ray yeah. Vaughan was super hot at that point. Like he was, mm -hmm. you know, the, the he was finally kind of making it into the public conscious. He was yeah. the, kind of the next generation of blues, legendary blues guitars, like the next Clapton, the next whatever. And he and Stevie Ray toured together. I remember I missed the tour because we were on a school trip to Virginia, like to see, you know, Monticello and stuff like that. And, you know. Mm colleges and stuff like yes. that and i was complaining you know i was complaining to one of the teachers like oh i'm missing stevie ray vaughn and jeff beck it's like ah you can see him next time I'm like well <laughs> there was no next time because stevie ray died and then jeff had to quit touring because of his tinnitus now i don't know if he had surgery to fix it i don't know if he just didn't play loud music for a number of years and and sometimes it, maybe it stopped ringing i'm not sure but i know he went to like a uh, like a sound check with guns and roses in the early 90s and one of matt sorum's cymbals crashed and it sent him deaf like deaf mm -hmm. for for a little while and he's like they're gonna get it they're all gonna get tinnitus i'm telling you but i mean i i guess he, he i don't know what happened but he got back on the road in like the late 90s and he kind of continued to tour throughout to the end of his life yeah i was trying to read about that because it did i mean he just kind of mentioned that he had tinnitus and then the the matt sorum deal but i didn't see anything like he went to you know switzerland and got some kind of experimental surgery i don't know if just laying off the the touring did that but he, yeah it, it seemed like he in the 80s he was kind of just over the whole thing which i'm actually kind of glad that he didn't put out really weirdo records or either or try to you know get, get in with some kind of pop band which he could have easily done mm -hmm. and that would have just been strange yeah no and he, he the fact of the matter is he didn't need it i mean despite the mm -hmm. fact that he never had a huge hit single in america or, or an enormous like you know multi-platinum or diamond selling album or anything like that he did fine i guess he did fine monetarily uh, and if you, you don't need the money then you just <laughs> you can just do what you want you can fix your hot rods and you can strum your guitar and kind of do as you please i guess i came to him in high school when you're starting to get into rock music and starting to realize i love guitar players and then you find mm -hmm. out and you know who eric clapton is you know who Jimmy Page is from Led Zeppelin. And you say, well, you know, there's this band, the Yardbirds, and they were in that band. And also there was a guy named Jeff Beck in that band. So it was like Clapton, Beck, and Page 
or the three, you know, successive Yardbirds guitarists that really kind of started, I mean, kind of started the guitar hero thing. The, the Beatles, you know, George and John were fine guitar players, but they weren't like guitar god type people. Right. Whereas Clapton yeah. was the first of those. And then mm-hmm. Jeff comes in, replaces him, like, oh, yeah, Jeff, Jeff can do all sorts of amazing stuff. And then Jimmy comes in, and that's that's kind of where the, the real guitar hero worship, I think, started. Yeah, absolutely. And, to, and the fact that it, it's interesting that the Yardbirds, I think they were probably a lot bigger over in Europe. They weren't bigger in the United States with having those three guys in the band at different point, different points is strange to me. I always thought that they should have been a lot bigger, but I guess that that music, it was just a little bit too funky for the American taste at that point in time. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're kind of a blues band. And yeah. then when they did For Your Love, which was kind of the hit mm-hmm. pop single, that's when Clapton's like, oh, no, no, I got to leave because I don't want to be popular i just want to play the blues you know kind of thing so jeff joins after he did a, and he did a lot of session work i feel like it would be impossible to to like even try to name like all the albums for all the people that he played with you know as a young man in the 60s i think the same with jimmy page like you know mm-hmm. he's played on like a thousand different records or something like that so he, he joins the Yardbirds. they wanted jimmy Jimmy's like, right. no, nah, i got a pretty good gig here being a session musician but my buddy jeff beck and can you imagine like they were friends as teenagers. Like Jimmy would pop around to Jeff's house and Jeff would be playing stuff off a record. I mean, wouldn't you like to be a fly on the wall back in the fifties or the <laughs> early sixties, I'm talking <laughs> early sixties, you know, to, to see those two fiddling around on their guitars. Yeah. Just hanging out, knowing what was to come. Absolutely. And it's interesting too. I didn't know that they were both in the band for a little while. I think Paige started off on bass when he was there and That's then he right. moved over. So yeah, that would have been a cool thing to see. And in reading about, Beck's time with the Yardbirds, he kind of seems like a, like he doesn't really care. Like he's very, he's he's a perfectionist and either you're going to do it right or, you know, well, we're going to kick you out of the band. I don't care. Whatever. That's fine. I'd rather do it my way than, than follow along with anybody else. And then there was a whole thing where he went into the, the hall of fame with the Yardbirds, yes. he's like, you know, they fired me, fuck them. Right, you know, exactly. like, oh, okay. <laughs> That's one of the best induction speeches right. ever. He's like, I, yeah. I'm supposed to be happy. Yeah. But they, but they kicked me out. <laughs> so fuck them. And Paige's behind him just cracking up. You know? <laughs> but I think you're right. He's a guy who, I mean, it, it, it's he must have sold records. He had to have sold records because in the 80s, he was on tax exile in the mm-hmm. United States. So, yeah, a guy who really never needed the money so he could do whatever he wanted to. Yeah, and I guess when he did tour, you know, he did well. And, you know, he collaborated with some amazing people, you know, like Stevie Wonder, you know, very superstitious. Mm. I mean, you got you to gotta be kidding me. I, I guess I didn't realize you know, most of their top the Yardbirds, back to the Yardbirds for a minute, most of their top 40 hits were, were recorded with Jeff Beck in there, you know, mm-hmm. um, including Heart Full of Soul, I guess. Which, you know, I've seen the video. It's It's got Jimmy Page in it. But yeah, no, they, I guess they had, they kicked him off the tour in the U.S. because he wouldn't show up and he was off and in a bad mood. And, you know, I don't think he really wanted to play, even though Jimmy was his buddy, I don't think he really wanted to play with a second guitar player. I think, he, you know, he's like, I got it kind of a thing um, and, and don't need Well, I think, I think that was evident, too, in the rest of his career. He never had a second guitar player after that. It was everybody That's else right. does their thing. I play the guitar. Yeah, he was. I guess he was only there for twenty months and really only only did one album with them. Yeah, it was it was over under sideways down, which is kind of a big hit. I think it was you know it, was, it became known as Roger the Engineer because it had that you know on the thing there. Uh, but uh, mm-hmm. it, it, and it's a, it's a great old blues album. I, I, but it's not just blues. It, it's got some psychedelic stuff in there. It's it, it's kind of a good classic record. But even from there, he's like, okay, well, I think I'll I'll move on and and try something else. You know. And he, he writes Beck's Bolero, which is kind of his signature song, I guess you could say. Wouldn't you say mm-hmm. Beck's Bolero is? Yeah. Yeah. Turn, that or, yeah, yeah. Correct. Yeah. And so instead of doing it with the Yardbirds, he had Jimmy Page on 12-string rhythm. He had Keith Moon on the drums. He had John Paul Jones on the bass. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Nicky Hopkins on the piano. I'm like, wow. You know, and that... That might have been some of the sessions um, where they were talking about how it would go over like a lead balloon. I mean, is it, it wasn't <laughs> Keith Moon with John Paul Jones and Jimmy? Wasn't that when they coined that phrase? I think so. And I was I, and I was listening to Bex Bolero for the show, thinking about Keith Moon playing drums, 
And at the beginning, he said, well, that can't be Moon. I mean, what are they? They, they physically tied him down with one, you know, only one yes. arm. But then but then about halfway through, he goes, he breaks out and goes nuts. He's and, Moon Zone. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Exactly. So no, and and him playing on Train Cup of Rome. Look, when we were in college, Jeff Beck's Beckology and Aerosmith's Pandora's Box came out, mm-hmm. and, and I think I, I think I might have gotten them both for Christmas. But I just remember because Crossroads was so big, Eric clapped it. It had everything, every band he was in, and then the hits, and then a lot of B sides and stuff that you wouldn't find was on Crossroads, like sixty three mm-hmm. to eighty eight, and they decided to give Jeff Beck the same treatment. I'm like, this is cool now because, you know, I, I can't have every Yardbirds record. I can't have all the Jeff Beck group records. You know, I can't mm-hmm. have Beck Bogard and a piece or, you know, the stuff he does with Jan Hammer. You can't go out and get them all, but to get this three disc box set, which was a killer box set because it was in the shape and the design of a, of a Strat box, like one of those kind of yeah. yellow classic Strat box. Mm-hmm. You open it up and on the inside, you know, it looks like a guitar in there with the book, beautiful book, and the CDs in there. That's what I think box sets started to really gain momentum. And if you had a catalog like Jeff's that was varied and you're in different groups and different eras, it was perfect for that. Yeah, and I remember listening to that, and and at that point in time, I really didn't know a whole bunch. I mean, I knew who he was. I knew the background, but listening to that box set, you say to yourself, he's all over the map with this. It, there's not like, I mean, you know, you listen to Clapton and yeah, there's, he, he, he kind of pretty he much kind of, blues. Yeah. He, he yeah, does a little he country a little here bit, and there, yeah. but yeah, it's, it's pretty much always back to blues. Boy, it's Jeff Beck, man. I mean, <laughs> you can't define it, you know? I mean, no, you know, it, it's, it's heavy metal or, or now some it's jazz. Now it's kind of mm-hmm. fusion. Now it's a little electronica, you know, uh, obviously there's some blues there back in the day. But then, you know, you, you do something like people get ready with Rod Stewart, you know, it's, it's just the tone he has right. is unbelievable. All right, hold on. We're going to get to that, though. Okay. Hey, guys. This is Ryan Condal, the executive producer, writer, creator of House of the Dragon. And you're listening to the Ugly American Werewolf in London podcast. And you should download and subscribe. Keep doing that. After he, uh, after he leaves the, the, the Yardbirds, he, he forms the Jeff Beck group. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, and the producer Mickey Most, who uh, who lived in St. John's Wood, by the way, he got one of those little blue plaques not far from where I okay. used to live, you know. Yeah. Which had a guy named Rod Stewart on vocals, Ronnie Wood on the bass, Nicky Hopkins on the piano, and then Ansley Dunbar, who we mentioned on our last show, who was a member of Journey and uh, and is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He was eventually replaced by Mickey Waller. He was kind of the main guy in the band, but the original Jeff Beck group had Ansley in it. Unbelievable. And they made Truth and Beckola. Truth mm-hmm. still being in 1968. Just something, I think it's for guitar players. I mean, not just rock fans, but if you're a, a, a guitar player, this is like, this is like, a, you know, it, it's like scripture. You know, this is like yeah. <laughs> very special. This is something that everybody goes back to. It's like, can you do any of this? Start here and see what you can do. Yeah. And I was listening to that record. And w- the one thing that really... um stood out to me on that was you know it, it we all know ronnie wood from the rolling stones obviously and the faces right you know playing the guitar he was really good on the bass just laying down this funky groove just kind of floating around you know obviously beck is the star he's playing the the main guitar parts but it, he's not just thumping around like he's playing his own stuff down there and it and uh, the other thing that really stood out for me was green sleeves mm. on that record it's a, I, mean, I don't know, it's probably from like the 1600s. I don't know when it was written, but it's just him. It's the acoustic guitar, which you don't hear him play a whole lot, but right. it's so clean. Like there's no, he, it doesn't, and I understand you can record it and fix mistakes, but I mean, his tone is just super clean on that. So if you're, you know, who was it? The, uh, did Paige say he's like the guitar player's guitar player? Yes. Yeah, 
Yeah. So, I mean, that you can really hear it on that record. Like, this guy is really, really good at what he does. Absolutely. You know, and, and all sorts of guitar players. And you can see it from the pouring out on social media. Obviously, when someone of his stature dies, you're going to get a lot of, you know, RIPs and a lot of tributes mm-hmm. and stuff like that. But who they were coming from and the way they said it, Jimmy Page. David Gilmour, you know, Mick Jagger. I mean, I, I could go into a list of a thousand names. I mean, even folks like Vernon Reed of Living Color. He's like, mm. no, fucking no, this can't be happening. <laughs> yes, yeah. The one for me was Billy Idol because he had a picture of him. I think it was in the late 80s or the early 90s. They they did something together. But I'm like, wow, even everybody knew him and everybody was reverent of him. Mm-hmm. Even a guy like Billy Idol, who you would think, that, I mean, that's not his, that's not his style of music at all. right. Former punk guy, now pop punk. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, no. Right. I, everyone had respect for him. And you had to. I mean, you had to. Uh, you couldn't see his talent and not be amazed by it, you know. And the fact of the matter is, after Sid Barrett left Pink Floyd, they they kind of wanted Jeff Beck. But none of them had right. the nerve to ask him, <laughs> is the way Nick Mason put it. The Stones considered him at least yeah. once. I mean, I, I think they considered him when Brian Jones left. But I think they may have... Also, even thought about all right when Mick Taylor left, like all right, maybe this is our chance to get Jeff back. Back, I don't mm-hmm. know. I don't know. That that is interesting. Trying to think about, it. I could see him in the Stones. That would be fairly easy. Although I don't know how he would have done with a second guitarist. I don't know. He, he would have. He, he wouldn't have been able to showcase like he needs to. But I don't know what he would have done in Pink Floyd. Well, but you know, this is that was pre Dark Side, right? So they're still spacey and crazy, and so yeah. he, he could make those other worldly sounds i guess mm-hmm. that to me would be more interesting than the stones personally yeah yeah i think i think you're right i think the stones he would have been operating on half power uh, or even a quarter of the power sharing the the spotlight with keith and that would have been a hard thing too because i mean i know keith always plays rhythm but he's in charge of what's going on his and lead rhythm reading the, <laughs> right yeah correct <laughs> you know? and reading the the yard bird and stuff i don't know how he would have put up with Mick and Keith. I don't think that would have lasted very long at all. Yeah, I think everyone made the right choice. Uh, <laughs> to be honest with you, you know, I mean, it would be amazing. It would be a super group, but it was already a super group, you know. So, right. So they took his his old bass player instead, and mm-hmm. it's been a pretty good run for them. Yeah, that, that worked out pretty well. The band that I think is cool was uh, Beck Bogard and, and a piece. Mm-hmm. Tim Bogard was a bassist and a singer and of course carmine a piece who's an amazing drummer also is part of the pantheon podcast network they're the rhythm section of vanilla fudge Mm. i guess he worked with them for a bit but then he uh i think he had an injury in a car accident accident. yeah Yeah, like cracked his skull open which is no good uh and so he he had to kind of convalesce for a couple of years Mm. so while vanilla fudge was done they were going to do something with jeff and because they couldn't then they made cactus which I didn't know that's where Cactus had come from, to be honest <laughs> with you. Seriously, you know. And um, and then, you know, it's all right. So they go off and do Cactus. And then he starts to to get better. And he, he works with Cozy Pal, who is not only an amazing drummer, but he kind of looks a lot like Jeff Beck. <laughs> and, like, seriously, I think I was reading something sometime. Yeah. It was like, you know, a bunch of drummers came in to audition or whatever. And, like, the assistant or somebody said, your brother's here. And he kind of looks around like, hmm, what? And it's like, yeah, there's Cozy. He's got the same haircut and he kind of looks the same. And if you look at the cover of, I can't remember what the cover of that, was it Rough and Ready maybe? Mm-hmm. It was one of those albums that it looks like there's two Jeff Becks. It, it wasn't Rough and Ready. It was uh, Jeff Beck Group maybe. I think it was Jeff Beck Group. Okay. One of those albums, it, it featured both their faces. Well, it featured all the band's faces on there. But it almost looked like there were two Jeff Becks when you look at Cozy quickly. See, see, see if you see what I mean there. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. See what I mean? Does, yes, yeah, correct. It totally looks like him. So yeah. you know, he he'd go out and do the Jeff Beck group and, and play with some some killer musicians, and eventually go back and and work uh, and work with Tim Bogert and and Carmine again to do BBA. And you know, here's the thing: it seems like some of his stuff is still out there, like it was never released, like the second Beck Bogert Apathy or a piece rather record was never finished. So that means it's still out there. And there's, you know, there's a couple songs, I think from those sessions that ended up on Beckology. Uh, but you know, there's, uh, there's some stuff I think he did with, uh, with Steve Cropper that's still out there somewhere. He, he did some, uh, some stuff with Stevie wonder 
obviously played on on Stevie's stuff, but you know they did. BBA did Superstitious on their own, mm-hmm. and he's like, I don't think Stevie liked our version. We did a heavy metal version of it, <laughs> and and to be honest with you, I I don't love it either. But it's just because I think I can't not hear Stevie's iconic classic song right it, it, yeah. I, I have to compare it to that you know i mean that's that's what it is and you know it's it's not nearly the same It does show off the, the sound they can make. Is I mean, for a three piece, those mm-hmm. guys could rock. And and it's interesting too to hear somebody else's take. I mean, I know that's a that's a classic Stevie Wonder tune, and then Stevie Ray Vaughan covered it uh, in the late '80s. Mm-hmm. But yeah, to, to hear somebody else do the same, you may not love it, but you can respect it because they love the song and wanted to put their own spin on it. Yep, and he did it in his own special way, man. I, I wonder now too. Because usually when someone passes away, you know, whoever's the executor, they usually crack the vault open and, you know, will put out a whole bunch of stuff. It'd be interesting to see what comes out of this. I don't know who's in charge of it. I mean, he's probably his wife would be, I would guess. I would guess. Yeah. And we'll we'll see what they come up with because it's usually this is the time when unreleased stuff hits the marketplace. Yeah. And there'll probably be a little time of mourning and some business probably has to, you know transact mm. one way or the other but yeah Be- jeff had no children uh he's married to sandra for a long time uh so uh, yes i assume that she would be in charge with stuff or maybe you know she'll go ahead and sell it uh and then one of the publishing companies right. would then be in charge and then they can figure it out yeah what's interesting is then after doing bands and doing blues based stuff and some hard rock heavy metal and experimental stuff he really kind of shifted gears and decided I'm not going to have a singer, at least not all the time, and should to do a more instrumental stuff. Not to mention, he put down the pick and started mm. to play exclusively with his fingers at a lot of whammy bar. That's for yeah. sure. But 75's Blow by Blow, which I think is his most popular album, at least in tour, terms of sales. You know, it was produced by the legendary George Martin at AIR Studios in Montserrat. Really great record. And, you know, it's got... The classic on there because we ended as lovers. Mm-hmm. It's got high fuff. What is it? Freeway Jam. That's a big Freeway Jam is is a big yeah. is a big one. Scatterbrain is one that he's mm-hmm. done on a on a regular basis. So and so he is writing some songs, but he's also doing covers, which would continue to be part of his life and part of his career and his catalog going forward. And I remember when I took my dad to see Jeff Beck. God, when was that? I set myself a note on when all the all the times I saw Jeff Beck four times. Was that was that the nineties or the two thousands? You think? Oh no, no, that was it was like twenty ten or twenty eleven. Oh, okay, something like okay. That. Yeah, but you're right. Blow by Blow's got a lot of cover stuff on here. Stuff that he did, but also you know two Stevie Wonder tracks. You know, she's a woman from Lennon and McCartney. So mm-hmm. it, it just it, it's interesting too what he wrote himself and then what he was kind of paying tribute to also. True. And it was good to see him writing his own stuff. And I guess the mm-hmm. perfectionist thing kind of continued because he's like he would go into the studio like middle of the night and tweak stuff and play stuff till, you know, till the sun came up or whatever. And he even <laughs> apparently at some point he went to George like, hey, I've got one more solo I want to fix on there. He's like, Jeff, the record's in the shops, man. We can't yeah. fix it anymore. <laughs> but no, it was my birthday in 2010. I, I took my dad up to, to see Jeff Beck in Indy, you know, and he played uh, Under mm. the Rainbow. I'm sorry, Over okay. the Rainbow. Um, Under the Rainbow was a was a kind of a bad movie, but Over the Rainbow is obviously a classic hit. And uh, and my dad's like, that's the best rendition of it I've ever heard. In fact, my dad, after he found that Jeff Beck had passed away, he said, "Thank you, thank you for taking me to see Jeff Beck because you know he was oh, awesome. He's older, you know. I mean, he's in his sixties. I'm like, and we're gonna have to drive from Louisville all the way up to Indy, and then we're gonna have to drive back two hours mm-hmm. and you know midnight or whatever. Are you gonna be up for this?" He's like, yeah, I can do it. I'll do it, you know. Um, and I think he's glad that he did. Yeah. 
And, and then I saw him, what, April 26, 2011, so the next year in Louisville at the Palace Theater. August 8, 2018, I saw him in Cincinnati on the Stars Line tour with Paul Rogers and Ann Wilson and Deborah Bonham. And then, yeah, I saw him May 30th in London with Johnny Depp. Mm-hmm. Uh, at Royal Albert Hall after waiting two and a half years. I held on to those tickets for two and a half years through COVID and reschedules and everything. And gosh, I'm really glad I did now, huh? Yeah. yeah. Despite and, Johnny. And it, yeah, it, it goes to show, you know, you, like you were talking about when you were in high school. Oh, we'll see him next time. Mm-hmm. You yeah, know, there's, if you have tickets, I would say go to anybody that you can right now because there may not be another, and there may not be a next sign. Yeah, and that's part of why we do the show. I mean, I go to these concerts so I can see them while they still do it, while you still have the opportunity, and while there's no mm. pandemic to keep you from seeing them. Uh, and then, yeah, we have the show to kind of preserve the music yeah. that we love and 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 hope that others find what we think is so amazing about it. But yeah, that because we ended as lovers. When we got Beckology, I have to admit, when I first got it, you know, I was like, I was really interested in like the yard burns, the blues kind of stuff, mm-hmm. the, the stuff from the early days. You get into the BBA stuff, I'm like, wow, some of this is, is even heavy. I don't know about all this. I mean, it wasn't bad. I'm like, hey, it wasn't maybe my thing. But then when I heard that, which is on disc three, it starts disc three. I'm like, ooh. Now that's a really cool song. It's kind of sexy. Mm-hmm. There's no lyrics. There's no singing. But you can hear what he's doing. It's so good. Well, you you say that, and there is no traditional singing, but the guitar is almost doing the main vocal part, and so it it kind of mirrors a human voice. So, it, and especially, you know, it's maybe a little later on in the evening. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe the lights are down. You kind of close your eyes and groove to it, and yeah, it it it's a great song. But I think that's probably what kind of kept him off the main mainstream charts and everything because it, you really have to want to listen to that you're not going to put that on you're not going to be driving around in the car and just hear it you have to want to do it and really get into what they're playing and listen to what's going on and that just doesn't track with a lot of pop music well that's right you know and instrumentals some mm. people can't stand instrumentals it's like if there's right. no voice there's no point but you're right in that the lament part if you're singing the blues well that's exactly what his guitar is doing and right. he could make it sound like nothing else. If you want to see and hear him really do something special where he's mimicking a voice, go to his induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He is a two-time member. So not his Yardbirds induction, but when he was individually inducted and Jimmy Page okay. inducted him in. And he's got was uh, Vinnie Collada and, uh, and the young girl, Tal Wilkenfeld. Feel, uh, mm-hmm. who, who's, I mean, she's older now, but I mean, when she was with Jeff, she was young, like early 20s, and she looked like she was about 14. She looked so yeah. young. But it was the two of them, and she was saying, hey, you know, if we've got Jimmy Page, we could play some Zeppelin stuff. Like, let's not just, I mean, let's play Blake's Bolero, of course, but let's, let's play something else. So they come out there, and they play Immigrant Song. With Jimmy okay. on the guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and Jeff is doing Robert Plant's bit on his guitar. It's like, whoa, dude. And it's not like they do this. This is like we've been doing this for decades. He just decided, okay, yeah, let's yeah. do this. It's amazing. He wasn't just a rock guitarist. He wasn't just a blues guitarist. He was something else. He was in his own category. Mm -hmm. You know, I I mean, not just not just rock music. I mean, they put him in the top five all time guitarists where he certainly belongs. But it's almost like he needs his own category 
because no. he, he could do things no one else could do. And yeah, and he, like I said, it's almost like he really never cared. He was going to play what he wanted to play, and you were you were going to follow along with him. And it's you know you said you mentioned that he didn't have any kids. And I was reading shout outs on Twitter, and Tal did say something about how you know she really considered him a father. And for a while, I think it was Wikipedia had her as his kid. No, like, really? That's not Yeah, that's not biologically true, but I definitely <laughs> feel like he was. And you could see when they played together, you could see that he would he would let her have a whole bunch of space yeah. to do her thing. And that was really cool. And that to me, that's the mark of somebody who is really, really good at what they do. Because you're like, I don't care. Everybody knows I'm the best. Let's let other people shine here for a minute. Yeah. And, you know, I got to give Jeff some credit on performing with females because it is very much a boys club. You look at mm-hmm. the Yardbirds, Jeff Beck group, BBA, it's a bunch of dudes and that's common in rock music. But you know, he, his bass player, Rhonda is awesome. She's a badass, and he mm-hmm. kept her with him for a long time. He, he uh, Carmen Vandenberg, who is a, an amazing guitar player in her own right, plays with bones. UK the singers, Rosie bones. He brought them up to tour with him a little bit, you know, and mentored Carmen a, a little bit, you know. And when I saw him play, Vinny Culotta was not with him, but and I still don't know her name, but he had this female drummer behind him. I'm like, well, that's cool. His whole rhythm section's female, man. How how great is that? You know, plus he's mm. he's he's always had a lot of uh opening acts who were female, you know. When I saw him with my dad, his opening act was a beautiful woman. What's her name from the Coors uh, was his opening act there in London, you know. So give him a lot of credit because I think uh, women have a really important role to play in the future of rock and roll and keeping mm-hmm. it alive. And he he got that kind of male-female energy thing. He must have. Yeah, and it's, I think it's just a different vibe, too, when you have when you have some ladies in the band. It's not all – I don't know. It just seemed like it when you watched him, it was kind of like a family kind of thing. You know, okay, you take this, you take this. And I know he played with uh, with um, Jennifer Batten for a while. That's right. The Michael Jackson band. That's right. And so, yeah, I think – well, the other thing, too, is if you're going to play with Jeff Beck, you have to be – you gotta really, have chops. Really good. Yeah. Yes. Correct. You have to bring it, but but those mm. ladies have it. You know. So it's, yeah, it's like yeah, I'll, I'll take. I'll, you know, I'm not taking yeah, so her because she's a woman. I'm taking her because she's right. awesome. That's what I was saying. Yeah, it's not it's not a novelty thing. This this the person that I have playing this instrument can play really really well. If it's a man, it's a woman. It doesn't matter. This is what I you know. This is who compliments his playing and the fact that he that he could play with women as equals. It was interesting too because, like you're right, it, it's and we've touched on this before. It, it is a boys' club, and he kind of broke down some stuff, and especially with Tal, because I mean, you're right, she was like 12 or something. When she she looked that way, yeah. yeah. She looked so young. I'm like, God, she's just a kid. Where did he find <laughs> her? You know. But but then, but then you're saying like, yeah, she's a. This is a child. This is some kind of. You know, it, is this his daughter? Like, who is this person that you know is out there? But. Wow, she can really, really, really play that bass. Yeah, no, she's she's awesome, you know, and I mean, yeah. she's she's a grown woman now. I mean, I guess she technically mm-hmm. was then, but she just didn't look it. But I would love to see her play. And I bet she's doing some tribute for him. Yeah, you would think. Uh, so he he made some more, you know, uh, records in the seventies after Blow by Blow, but I mean that one went platinum for him, which is which is pretty damn good for you know someone who doesn't sell a, a ton of records. And the follow-up, 76 is Wired, also went platinum uh, in the U.S. So you know that gave him the ability to chill out a little bit. But he, he really didn't do much in the 80s. There and back in 1980, Flash in 85, and then Jeff Beck's Guitar Shop, which we talked about, was 89. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that did pretty well. I remember both commercially and, uh, and the critics loved that one as well. Yeah. But, you know, one video that I love is the ARMS video. It was artist. Oh, the ARMS concert. The ARMS concert, yeah. yeah which they, it was, mm-hmm. you know, the, there was a lot of amazing musicians on there. But the, the highlight, I feel like, the reason, the price of admission was to have Clapton, Beck, and Page not only on the, on the stage at different times doing their stuff, but playing together mm-hmm. and when they did Tulsa time which is not a song I really knew I guess it was a Clapton song and it was cool to watch them trade and, and Clapton would kind of give them the nod like okay it's your go and now it's your go yeah and Jeff went between Eric and Jimmy Jimmy was pretty rough still at this time you know yeah, so wait what, what, what year was 82 it? I think it was maybe yeah, okay. 83 and, yeah. Jimmy wasn't looking very good he was very thin mm-hmm. I don't know what his situation with his 
habits were at that point. I feel like he was trying to clean up, but he, he was a little rough. And although I thought the way he did Stairway to Heaven without a singer, him just doing the solo and, and all that kind of stuff, it was amazing. But I feel like it was almost like he was trying too hard that night. Like he was trying to keep up. Whereas for Jeff, it was mm. effortless. And he had a smile on his yeah. face. The usual, usually kind of dour Jeff. He was happy to be out there doing his thing with them. It seemed like he took some joy in it. Yeah, and, and it's, it's interesting to watch him to play it, it just it, in the live setting because it looks like you know what you're going to play, right? Because it almost looks like he's kind of making it up as he goes along. And so it to have that kind of mastery of the instrument and to watch him do that, it really is, yeah, that that night he was not really on cruise control, but you could he was having a great time and just kind of grooving with everybody else. But yeah, it, it almost like he was holding back a little bit. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's you know, you, you can't totally outshine those other guys. I mean, you you right. want to cut hands, you want to push each other, but you don't want to make them look bad. <laughs> and and Clapton was worried about that. I think the rest of his life, because Clapton hosts this thing and or has hosted in the past. I think you know, uh, it's like a two or three day crossroads guitar festival where he just mm. gets people he loves, people he admires, people who are awesome at the guitar. You know, and all sorts of different people, right? I mean, a lot of blues guys, but, you know, Stevie Winwood will come, you know, uh, Carlos mm. Santana. I mean, also just a couple days line up. They do it in a big football stadium and the money goes to the Crossroads Center in the Caribbean, which is for recovery and addiction and stuff. There's there's one like from 2012 or something like that where Jeff, Jeff plays before Eric does and he's playing Nessun Dorma which uh, is, you know, a release off, I think, his 2010 record, something like that, that actually won a Grammy. By the way, he won eight okay. Grammys. Uh, I, yeah. I never knew that. No, I didn't either. What I, and I was doing research for this thing. And, yeah, and I, yeah he, he did all kinds of stuff. That just shows that, like we were talking about before, he really is the musician's musician when you go back and look at the hardware that he's got and all the stuff that you may not know that he was on. Mm-hmm. That he contributed to right yeah no he's, he's all sorts of and he played with jan hammer well mm-hmm. you gotta be pretty good to be able to keep up with him of course we we know jan best for his contribution to uh, miami vice correct but he did a lot more than that and actually i was wrong when i mentioned it was blow by blow where he he left the pick put the pick down it was actually jeff beck's guitar shop uh oh, okay so yeah that started later on yeah. That, so that was 89 and it's interesting to think at that point in time he just decided to change the game up and say I've eh, I've kind of done all I can. Let me see what else is out there. Can I make this? Have, you know, can I make different sounds? And I, and we were talking about it on the Johnny Depp show, the, the Johnny Depp eighteen record. Mm-hmm. He, he, when he would pl- he plays and he's got the he he plays with his thumb a lot. He strums That's with right. his thumb and he's got the whammy bar kind of in between. And so he's working that almost as another so instead of having six strings you kind of have seven because you're messing with that tone yeah no it, it's it's pretty special it's it's sort of inimitable it's 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 very hard yeah. for anyone else to do it and you know he but he would pop up once in a while he, he you know he did people get ready with rod stewart everyone thinks that well, that's a rod stewart song well, it's a jeff beck song with his old singer you know and that put him on the charts it got a video that you know that went on mtv he yeah. popped up in twins the Danny DeVito, Arnold Schwarzenegger class, when they're in the bar, the country bar, who do you think the guitar player is? Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. And I, I'm sure I did not cop to it the first time I saw Twins for two seconds. But right. uh, yeah, I, I remember I remember seeing that later. Like, did you know? No. no. And then you watch that scene. Oh, there he is. Yeah. And you can hear it. I mean, once you know what to listen for, it's like, well, mm-hmm. well, I guess it's obviously Jeff Beck. He may have done, yeah. was it, I know they did a, a, a version of Train, a Train Kepper Rowan. Huh. But what I was going to say is back to Nessun Dorma. It's kind of this amazing, uplifting song. And it's got some amazing, powerful bending and note holding from Jeff. And you can see, you can see Jeff on stage doing his thing. And then off stage, there's Clapton going, 
oh my god, what what the hell is he doing? Like, gee, he's like rubbing his head. He's like, what what am I supposed to do? Because he's got to go follow it. He's like, I'm just, I'm just, you know, I'm going to go out with my acoustic guitar and my you know my flip flops and sit out there and pick a little bit. How, how, you can't follow this man. He's like, what is he doing to me? He's like, he still can't fathom it. You know. What I mean? You know, the 90s, look, he, he had the problems with tinnitus, but he did some things and played on some things. I, I feel like the, the thing from Ronnie Scott's, you know, Live This Week from Ronnie Scott's is a video mm -hmm. that they, they did in London, Vinnie and Tal. And then they had a lot of guest people on, you know, like Imelda May. And, and he did have uh, Eric Clapton come out. And, and Eric's like, I'm just, I you know, I'm fortunate that he asked me. I'm, I, you know, I'm like, dude, whatever, you're Eric Clapton, you know, you're... Yeah. Everyone wants to play with you. Even Jeff Beck is like, well, I can't believe he did. And then who's the audience? Jimmy Page in the audience. Robert Plant is in the audience. Like everybody wants to come to like, he's a musician's musician. Mm -hmm. Kind of like all the drummers would always show up to see Neil Peart play in Rush. Right. All the guitar players and singers, everybody would show up to see Jeff Beck work his magic. And I can imagine that too, if you would get somebody like a Clapton aside and, you know, there's no, we're talking off the record here. I'm not going to say anything to anybody. You know, what are your real impression of Beck and have him say something to the effect of, yeah, he can do things that I can only like, I'm really, really good at what I do, but he's just on another level. Like the things that he can make that guitar do, I can't even, I couldn't even think of. Yeah. And that's Eric Clapton. And, right. and, Derek, and David Gilmore said something similar. He's like, he can do things with the Stratocaster that, that no one else can do. Believe me, I've tried. I'm like, <laughs> and like David Gilmore can't do it. You don't think David Gilmore knows his way around a Stratocaster and a whammy bar? You don't think right. he can figure it out? Well, if he can, yeah. I, don't, I don't know who can. And that was kind of the joke on, on Twitter. He's like, you know, I'm sure there's going to be a tribute, but I don't know who's really going to play it because nobody can play like him. So, you know, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. they'll play his songs, but they're going to play it like him. That's for sure. You know, Right. Yeah. Who's going to, yeah. <laughs> Not me, mm -mm, not me. I'll play, yeah, I'll play rhythm on that, but no, no, thank you. Right, you know, and it's like, did you know he played on Seal's first album that had Crazy and Killers on it? Yeah, Jeff Beck's on that thing. Like, oh, really? Because that was a mega platinum selling record. That was huge. He's just, he's just around. Yeah. He's just in demand, and he would show up and work with people. And sometimes they were huge stars, but sometimes, you know, Bones, Rosie Bones, is not an enormous star. You know, he just admires her work. Said, okay, I'm going to play with her. He just, yeah, he just played on that. What was that? Patient Nine or something from, from Ozzy Osbourne? Osbourne? Yeah. Yeah. What do you think? I, I didn't think those two things went together, but okay. <laughs> um, I didn't know he played on, what was it? Blaze of Glory from John, John Bon Jovi. Jovi. Yeah. From the Young Guns 2 okay. soundtrack. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, he's, he's always in demand. I mean, you got to pay him, mm -hmm. but, but you know, you pay him, he's there, you know? Right. Hi, I'm Deborah Bonham. And I am the Irish werewolf in England. Peter Bullock. <laughs> and you're listening to The Ugly American Werewolf in London. Here's interesting. On June 2nd, 2022, he was in the news. He was in the news after Depp appeared with him at the Sage in Gateshead following the victory of his high-profile defamation case against Amber Heard. Mm -hmm. And they both yep. had also performed at the Royal Albert Hall in London earlier in the week. I was there in the fourth row. And I was just, I just remember being a really nice night. I had, I wouldn't call him VIP because it's not like I got to go backstage and get to meet him or take a picture with him or anything like that. You basically got yeah. in early. They give you a little bit of merch. Like I got a Jeff Beck water bottle. Mm. I got a Jeff Beck lanyard. I think I got a Jeff Beck poster and maybe something else. But I remember just sitting there because the first time I had been to Royal Albert Hall was for Nick Mason's Saucer Full of Secrets. And I basically walked mm. right in like one minute. I was in my seat and within a minute they started the show. This one, I obviously got there early so I could go down there and walk around. There's some nice bars down there, and they have pictures up around the bar of everyone who's played there over the years. And I remember I was just looking right at Dave Grohl was right in front of me, like the whole time I was having my pre, like my warm-up beer or whatever. Went down to the fourth row there, and uh, 
it was amazing to be on the floor of Albert Hall. Look up, there's Jeff Beck. Now, when Johnny Depp came out, I, I wasn't surprised because it already happened, you know, earlier in the week. Right. But yeah. everyone was pretty excited about it. Some moron British dude in front of me was like, oh, no, he already left. Johnny was here, but he took off. I'm like, well, he, he probably just went to score some dope, man. He'll be back, you know. <laughs> and then when he came back, I'm like, so he's not coming back, is he? Know it all, British jackass. But anyway, don't, don't want to alienate our second biggest market. The cool British people know that there are a lot of jackasses in their country, just like we know there are a bunch in ours. One or two, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, it kind of sucks after waiting two and a half years to see Jeff Beck. I got to see him with Johnny Depp. There was a lot of that on the on the interwebs here, you know, th- th- lamenting that same thing. Like, well, you know, I mean, I was really there to see Jeff Beck, really couldn't have cared two shakes about Johnny Depp. Yeah. Would have been great if he came out for one or two songs. It's, it's but, like I mean, seven. When him, <laughs> yeah, when you saw him, he was up there for uh, the bulk of the concert. Half right? the show, probably, you know, okay. or maybe not quite 40%, something like mm-hmm. that. Uh, and also, Johnny was, was kind of all about him, and I'm like, ah, really, Jeff, why do you... You don't need this. But but like we said on our show, was that show number 90? I think it was. If this gets more people interested in Jeff Beck to come back to find his music and his brilliance, doing this thing with Johnny, mm-hmm. then fine. I, I'm all for it. And, and Johnny isn't a, a terrible singer or a terrible guitar player. But like we said earlier on the show, you have to have the chops to play with Jeff Beck. And right. Johnny just doesn't have it, you know. So, okay, so that's an interesting question. So when you saw them play together, would, did you think that Beck was kind of way holding it back so it didn't look like, you know, somebody who didn't know what they were doing on the other side? You know, I, look, Johnny is a professional, muse- his, his professional musician. It may not be his first profession, but he, you know, he's been with Hollywood Vampires. You know, mm-hmm. he was uh, he was in Tom Petty videos as a rock star, so it must be true. No, I mean, uh, <laughs> was he holding back? It was. It wasn't necessarily he was holding back. He was sharing the spotlight. Okay. Okay. So he was he was not doing anything to outshine. Yeah. Right. Even though I mean, okay. musically, you know, he can run circles around him, and when it's his time right. to kind of break in and do the guitar part, he can really wow you. But I mean, I think his best work was on the guitar was done while Johnny was not on the stage. That's my opinion. So I'm glad I saw him four times. I'm kind of sorry that was mm. the last one, but I got to see him yeah. Royal Albert Hall. got to see him in London. You know, that's something I could take to my grave, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And the interesting part too, about the, the whole, I thought it was just kind of a novelty thing, the two of them, mm-hmm. but apparently like they, because I, I was listening to that uh, town hall they did with Stephen Van Zandt. It seems like they're legitimately were friends. Like I think Depp was living at his house for a while when he was having some really hard times. So it 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 seemed like a real friendship that they had together. I mean, yeah, it seems legit to me. He's like Johnny just started knocking on my door one day, and yeah, you know, and and they said that you know they can't. He wanted to meet him. Depp wanted to meet back, and okay, fine. And then they just kind of hit it off and and went from there. So, hey, I mean, I'm glad he had a good friendship out of it. I think the album did mm-hmm. fine. Yeah. Uh, and and there's, you know, there's a couple of highlights on there, but it's, you know, it's, I, I you know, I'm not going to listen to that over blow by blow. I'm not going to listen to that no. over truth or, or, or no. Mike Ola or something. But I, I will say that I did go back for this the last couple of days and, and put the guitar shop back on. That's a pretty good record. Pretty cool. And what was it? Tony Hymas yeah. and Terry Bozio. I mean, that's, yeah. again, high end, high end. Mm-hmm technical talent with these guys and that's really what you need but you get those guys all together and that's where the real magic can happen and it's like let those guys really go off and set some kind of incredible foundation and then what he can flurry over it yep no one else can do it inimitable one of the greatest ever sorry he's gone and i'm, I'm sorry we have to kind of continue to do these shows but i mean that's kind of what when your favorite when your favorite artists are all a generation older than you and you're middle aged, <laughs> then this is unfortunately yes. this is a recurring this, theme. This will be <laughs> yeah yeah. I the the one thing that I really got from from looking back over his career is that I, I know you said in the nine in the eighties you know we were talking about he kind of shut it down for a while, but once he came back, he was pretty much back the entire time. Yeah, like he never he never really took any time off, which to me is the hallmark of somebody who really just enjoys playing. He doesn't have to do it for the money. He doesn't have to do it for anything else other than what else can I do with this thing? What other music, who else can I work with? Mm -hmm. What else, what other music can I play? And just, you know, 
enjoying himself. I know. I'm a, I'm a bigger Rod Stewart fan since having Jim Cregan on. Yes. But I was never a huge fan of his, but I remember seeing Rod just a couple of years ago saying, hey, like Clapton and Winwood got together and did that tour, you know, because they'd been in blind faith together back in the yeah. day. They did a tour together. It was amazing. So glad I saw that. He's like, I still got the voice. You got the guitar. Eh, maybe we should. And you know what? Mm-hmm. That would have been huge for him. Kind of would have been huge for both of them. Right. If they could have gone back and do that, because he was Rod was very much in his like American standards, his crooner mode at that point. But yeah. but to go back and do some of the songs they did together, plus they could do each other's stuff, mm-hmm. that would have been a cool tour. That would have been something to see. Yeah, especially you know, I, I listening to have they would have to have done people get ready, and that would have been huge, awesome to see live. And and yeah, you maybe get Rod into more of the you know less of the new stuff, more of the old stuff. Mm-hmm. And honestly, I think I think we need to go back and do review of one of, if not both, of the Jeff Beck group records. Rough and Ready and uh, and Jeff Beck group. Yeah, we could uh, we could certainly. Or do that. or no, I'm talking about Truth and oh, and Beckola. Beckola. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Rough. We can do Rough and Ready also, but those two with, with Rod Stewart. It's too bad that I, I couldn't really get into why they didn't why that didn't keep going. But I mean, that was a great band and I don't know why they decided to go their separate ways. Was it the car accident? Was it, was it that? I don't know because, it, because it looked like he was already trying to work with apathy oh, right. at that point in time. So I, I really don't know. I'd have to do a little more research on that, but it's kind of cool too, that it's just those two. And then he moved on to do something else. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then the faces kind of became the faces with Rod and, right. and, and Ronnie, you know? So yeah, yeah he's, he, he, I think he gets that from Clapton too. Clapton's like, okay, I've been here too long. I've been in cream. We've already made five mm-hmm. albums. I got to move on. I, now I got to move on. Right. I got to go. And then with Delaney and Bonnie, now I got to move on, you know? So, yeah. and I, I just think that was part of who he was. He, he, he didn't mm-hmm. want to get pushed in a box. He didn't want to just play the same old hits over and over again. He wanted to work with different people. And you could see he would, mm-hmm. he would do something with folks for a while and he would stop. And then he would go do something mm-hmm. else. You know, that was just always searching for new sound. I mean, he even said in the 60s, everyone looks at the 60s with these rose-colored glasses. For me, it's like the technology had not caught up to what I was looking to do. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, he had a killer talk box. Remember, he had we that Black Cat Moan or whatever. He had the talk box just like Peter Frampton or Joe Walsh, you know. He, he could do that, and it was really cool. Remember our buddy Pete's like, Hey man, why did he rip off? Why did Peter Frampton rip off Jeff Beck? I'm like, well, Jeff Beck didn't invent the talk box, Pete. Anybody can. Have <laughs> that's po- that's yeah. pilot Pete uh, now, by the way. Ah, uh, yes. Pete. Can you imagine that? Yeah. Yes. Of all people, we're, in, we're cruising at thirty thousand feet. This is Pete, not that Pete. Oh. <laughs> just a, an amazing gift to us all, and it wasn't just rock yeah. and roll. I mean, that that's kind of what got him in the door, but. Again, he was in his own stratosphere. There, there's no one else like yeah. him. I doubt we see anyone like him again or or that I would find them, you know, because they're going to be so underground. It, it would be, you know, it would be hard for me to to come across them, I guess. And I think it, it would be hard to, you would say the next Jeff Beck. I don't think there is a next Jeff. I mean, he, like you said, he's in his own deal. You should just try and do something else because you'll never, you'll never match that the vibe that he had, I don't the think. The vibe, the tone, the technique, and yeah. the breadth of everything that he did. You know, not everyone can play heavy metal and jazz and blues and rock mm-hmm. and, you know, all that stuff the way he did. Gone, yeah, like I said, 78, but it really feels like gone too soon. Absolutely. Well, folks, that's our take and our tribute to the late, great Jeff Beck, who left us January 10th, 2022, after 78 plus years on this earth and giving us some incredible music along the way. A true innovator, someone to me who is inimitable. No one else has ever played quite like Jeff Beck and someone who didn't really, it's not that he didn't want to make money. It's not that he didn't want to have successful tours or, or have adoring fans. It's that he didn't want to get stuck in a situation. He didn't want to get trapped having to play the same old songs all the time, working with the same old people in the same genre. He was his own person. He went out and did his own thing. I was very fortunate to see him four times, including the second to last show he ever played at Royal Albert Hall. And I, I believe it's the second to last show he ever played in London. Too bad it was with Johnny Depp. Sorry, Johnny, but you're just not what I was looking for when I bought those Jeff Beck tickets 
three years ago or whenever it was. But it's just one of those things where I'm glad that I got to know his music, was fortunate enough to see him play live a few times, and glad that I'm still around so I can tell other people about his greatness and why they ought to be listening to Jeff Beck. And that includes you, and we appreciate you tuning in. And we want to know, do we get something right, do we get something wrong? Do we miss the point? Do we leave out your favorite part? What was your favorite Jeff Beck album? Did you ever get to see him live? How would you describe his style? Let us know. Email us, uglyamericanwerewolf at gmail.com. You can tweet us or DM us at ugly underscore werewolf or at actionjack72, where you can let us know the bands, the albums, the DVDs, the concerts that you love and you want to hear us talk about. Thanks, as always, to our friends at Pantheon Pods. Special thanks to Deborah Bonham and Peter Bullock, who is there on show number 72. But thanks for letting us use that snippet of Peter's time, getting to run uh, Jeff's rig and play Jeff's stuff through there. Uh, the unsuspected audience thinking, well, maybe Jeff's lost a step or two, just because Peter was not familiar with Jeff's work. He hadn't played in a long time, and it sounded like... Well, not Jeff Beck playing Jeff Beck stuff, so appreciate that for them. Sorry for your loss. And if you want to go get some nice Jeff Beck stuff, some original first edition Jeff Beck records and CDs, go to our sponsor, rarevinyl.com, and use the code PODCAST. I saw a pristine copy of Truth on there, which is not the easiest thing to find. It was a few hundred quid, if I'm not mistaken, but use our code PODCAST and save 10% on that. A lot of people are going to be buying his records now that he's gone. You want something collectible. You want something in great condition. You want something that's valuable. Go to rarevinyl.com or eil.com. Use the code podcast. Get your stuff from them today. Now, last time I said next week, we're going to be talking about Jerry Rafferty and then Jeff Beck died. So I'm not going to say what we're doing next week. It will probably be Jerry Rafferty city to city, but I don't know. Something else could happen, and it could derail us from doing Jerry Rafferty city to city. I know we'll do that at some point, folks. Just hang in with us. We've got a few other cool things lined up later this month and next month that I think you're going to like. But just please download and subscribe wherever you get your podcast. If you're thinking about it, please give us a positive review. It just helps us find rock and roll fans like yourselves, helps grow the show, It helps us get more guests. So until next time, whether that's on Jerry Rafferty or something else, to all of you rock and roll fans all around the world, be cool and stay safe.